Well, again, thank you for being here today. Um, I, I pray that we've, we've come with, with open minds and, and open hearts today to allow uh, God, through His Holy Spirit, speak to us. Um, I pray, especially for today's topic, that we are not here thinking so-and-so should be here for this, okay? Um, of all Sundays, and we typically have an air about us sometimes, we come in and we hear something and we, we think, man, I wish, in a good way, right? But, but we're talking about kind of a bad way, and so we're, we're working through and actually finishing up this series, What Would Jesus Undo? And we've really been working through, it's, it's been, for me at least, uh, it's been really challenging to me personally to kind of work through this, because what we assumed, like last week with hypocrisy, we just assumed well, that's not me. I'm, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not one of those people. But when you really dissect it and begin to think through what that really looks like, um, you know, on, this, on, on some level, all of us are, are professing to believe something about God, yet we're not doing it. And on just the basic of basics ones is if, if we're believing that God has called us to witness, yet we can't remember the last time we shared our faith story with somebody, somebody outside the church, then what does that make us? It, it, it truly does make us a hypocrite if we have the best story ever told, if we have the story that changes and transforms lives. And on, in the big pieces, it rescues people from hell, right? And so if we're not telling that story, at least instrumental in that story being told, then that simply makes us a hypocrite. And so today, if hypocrisy was tough, I just, today you're talking about spiritual pride and what grieves God's heart. What this is not, it's not about taking pride in a job well done. If you've built a, 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 a nice, healthy, uh, sustainable career, if you're a coach of a team and you've found success, we're not talking about, you know, not finding pride in that and taking pride. If you're a teacher and your your students are making, you know, good grades and last year you had some great scores, right? And so all of that, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take pride in something. It, should, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't celebrate. As Christians, it doesn't mean if we win a game, we're being prideful by clapping for one another and congratulating, right? We don't apologize because we got the ring and no one else did. Are we clear? Okay, so that's not what we're talking about. Even in Christianity, right, everybody doesn't get the ring and doesn't get the trophy, okay? And so we're not talking about being against celebrating and taking pride in something going as planned and finding success in this life. What we're talking about is when we find significance or seek significance and value in others or anything else outside of God. When we try to find our value and our significance in this life rather than in Him, essentially what we're saying is, I've got this. I don't really care what God thinks. We may not verbally say that. We may not even think what that we're saying or thinking that. But hopefully as we work through some of this today, maybe God will kind of enlighten us about maybe there's something in my life that may be a little bit prideful. We've all heard the phrase that pride comes before the fall. And essentially that's what we're talking about today is that God would undo the pride in our life, wherever that may be, so that we don't experience a fall. And that's in any area of our life. We don't want pride to come up that we believe so heavily in some, friend, some friendship or some relationship that we trust it and we don't pour into it. And we say, well, that'll never happen to me. We see it in somebody else who says, well, my marriage will never, it'll never happen like that. Well, my kids will never do that or my church will never do that. That'll never happen to me is a common denominator for those who what? Experience that kind of brokenness and that kind of hurt. And just because you've experienced it doesn't mean it was, it was on you or all on you. So we're talking about this pride. What it does for me is it reminds me that I've got to give the right amount of attention to every area of my life. And then ultimately, I've got to give the ultimate attention to Him because it's all in His hands. I can't control it. And so I've got to trust Him. One of the most loving things that we can do for someone, especially someone we love, is to look them in the eye and to speak truth, especially the hard truth. And some of you have been on each side of those. I have. 
I've been on those sides where I love one, someone enough that I'm going to speak that truth. Whatever, it may be a blind spot, it may be something they're dealing with, and you know, just, hey, this is, this, we need to work through this. We need, we need to confront this in love. But I've also been on the other side of it where someone has loved me enough, thank God, to come to me and say, hey, you, this, you're missing it. You're, you're missing this area. And so I pray that today we would, we would allow ourselves to be that person Let's not build a wall right now. Let's not put it up because I want, I want us to allow God through his Holy Spirit to confront us in love and just be open and exposed before him. Say, God, if there's anything, God, show me because I don't want to experience the fall in any area of my life. So if there's pride that's kind of made its way in, in some area, speak it to me in love. So let's get into our scripture, Luke 18. So basically two people go to the same place to do the same thing. They go into the temple, into the synagogue, and they're going to pray. One leaves the synagogue right with God, the other doesn't. But the problem is both assume the opposite is true. One assumes, hey, I'm good with God, but he's not. The other assumes, man, I'll never be good with God, but they are. And so I don't know how you came today, right? There's something about humility, and we'll talk a bit more about that. So Luke chapter 18, begin verse 9. And he, this is Jesus, also told this parable to some people who trusted themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. We'll come back to that, but isn't that interesting? Have you ever prayed to yourself, right? So, all right, so to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. And he calls it out, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. It's not just speaking in generalities, right? He calls out the person. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Before we get into these two characters, I'm reading through this, I think, yes, it's a parable. But I believe that Jesus saw this over and over and over and over. He saw it in the hearts of the Pharisees. He saw it in the hearts of the people. And yes, he spoke in, the, in, in a parable, but I believe that this kind of thing was prevalent in the church in that day. So what you knew about the Pharisee? He would have known and been able to recount all 613 of the Israelite laws in those days. And not only would he have been able to recite all 613 plus the ones that they made up as they went on, he would have lived them out. I mean, it wasn't like he was saying, hey, I you know, I, I know all this stuff, and he wasn't. He was following it to a T. And so he's living it out, but his righteousness in his own eyes was based on his goodness. It had nothing to do with how good God was. He was basing his own righteousness and his standing with God was not based on God and how good and how holy God was and the fact that he had saved him. It was all based on God. I'm so good, you're lucky to have me. That's essentially how he saw himself. And then you had the tax collector. Now, the tax collector wasn't an innocent guy. He was the oppressor. He was the, he was the picture of the ones that the people in the community hated. And so you think about this kind of behind the scenes. You're looking at this. By, by the time Luke 18 rolls around, one of the disciples is around Jesus at the time he calls out the tax collector. And one of the disciples was a tax collector. He was a Jewish tax collector. His name was Matthew. Now, Matthew was not just the oppressor and not just despised by everyone, but he was especially despised by his own people. Because what you need to know about the tax collectors in those days, what they were doing is Rome was ruling over Israel and, and, and the area in Jerusalem. So what they were doing is they were charging these taxes, and they were great grand taxes. taxes. And so not only was the tax collector collecting that tax, but he was also saying, you know what, I want to take a cut of my own. So just say it was 10%. Then he would say, well, I'm going to take an extra 2%, and I'm not going to give that to Rome. I'm going to give that to myself. And they saw these tax collectors just collecting money on their own. And so then you throw in a Jewish tax collector who's not just working for Rome to make a living. Maybe some of that, they could have shown some grace and compassion. Well, that's the only job he could get. And maybe he's on the inside, so maybe he'll work for us. No, these Jewish tax collectors, and Matthew would have been one of those, was hurting his own people. He was doing what the Roman tax collectors were doing, 
And so it was one of their own on the inside taking advantage of them. So you had these two people praying, calling out to God. The Pharisee separated himself. How do you separate yourself? The Pharisee stood up, and there's a crowd praying over here. He was among them, and he recognized that, you know what, at least on his own, he said, I don't belong in this crowd. (laughs) I'm better than them. So he steps over in earshot, according to the parable, of the people that he thought, thought better of them, and he begins to pray. And essentially, Jerry, here's what he says. He says, God, thank you that I'm not like these losers over here that can hear me and what I'm saying. Can we just make it relevant? I mean, can you just hear that? I don't think Jesus had a problem with us using that today. I I think that's essentially what he was saying. He says, I'm better than them, and they know it. And so I'm so filled with pride that I'm going to call them out. And I would imagine in this parable, he's kind of using this, and the people are getting this picture because they've seen it and they've heard it on some level. So as he's praying, imagine he's going, God, I'm so good. Thank you that I'm not like the swindlers. I'm not like the thieves, and I'm not like that. The tax collector came? I thank God I'm not like him because everybody hates him, but everybody loves me. The problem was the tax collector was well aware of how people felt about him. The Pharisee was so filled with pride, he had no idea how people felt about him. Pride. Let's continue on in verse 13. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. See the contrast? But was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. So it's almost like he heard the Pharisee praying, and he's saying, I believe it. Yes, I am a tax collector. I am worse than you. He accepted who he was while the Pharisee had no idea who he was. God, be merciful on me, the sinner. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. And he's talking about the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And some of you are saying, well, this really doesn't relate to me because in this picture, spiritual pride is about somebody praying out loud in public about themselves, and I've never prayed in public, and I'm never going to pray in public, so I'm never going to be prideful in that way. You're missing it, right? That's not what it's about. It's about the heart. And if that's where pride, spiritual pride, resides, is in the heart, then you and I can't detect it. We can't see what's in our heart without God through the Holy Spirit who resides within our heart. And so who do we have to go to in order to be able to see if there's pride that's kind of creeping up in the heart? We have to go to Him. Again, as I did earlier, I pray and I challenge you to just Open up your mind, open up your heart. Invite God to just speak truth there. Expose yourself, say, God, help me to see it. Because I don't want to experience the fall. I've watched too many fall. I don't want to experience that, so help me to see it before it happens. Now, we're going to walk through these rather quickly. Because some of you, since we didn't have any fill-in-the-blanks last week, you think I'm making up for the lack of that last week, right? So that's not the case. We're going to walk through these rather quickly there's seven subtle symptoms of pride there's a preacher and a great theologian years ago his name was jonathan edwards and he wrote an essay years ago called undetected pride and i found it so insightful as i was researching for this message because where do you go with pride how do you work through that what does that look like and so when when carol found that for me i felt like man this is so good i'm just gonna just take what what he wrote, uh, at least these points, the the symptoms, and kind of just share them with you. Because honestly, as I was working through this this week, God just wrecked me, to be honest with you, because I I entered into it. I I, I can't say that I was the Pharisee, okay? I can't say I was the Pharisee, Jimmy, but I I really was working through it, going, okay, this message, I've got to preach this to the people. And then all of a sudden, as I'm working through it, God says, 
let me deal with you first, right? And that's usually how I try to approach it, but it was almost like God said, all right, let's, and so I hope and I pray that, that God maybe does the same kind of thing in you. Number one, if you're taking notes, fault finding. The first symptom of pride, a subtle symptom, is fault finding. See, while pride causes us to filter out the evil we see in ourselves, I believe that pride, spiritual pride, blinds us of how we see ourselves, just much like the Pharisee couldn't see that he was being prideful, couldn't see that he was being condescending. Spiritual pride blinds us to our own struggles, to our own sin, to our own selfishness. But what it also does is it filters not just how we see ourselves, but it filters the good we see in others. And here's what that looks like. We don't see our own selfishness. We don't see our own lack of gentleness. We don't see our own failures and mistakes in, in, in whatever area of life you want to say. We don't see the mistakes we're making handling our finances sometimes, but you know what we can see? We can see someone else mishandling and misusing theirs. We don't see what we're doing in our own relationships and our own marriage. We can't see our flaws, but what can we see? We can see it in everybody else. And so the spiritual prideful person is not looking on the inside. They're always looking, okay, let me just find fault. And they may not speak it all the time, but that's where all they're seeing it. And the danger in that, here's what happens is, if I'm always comparing myself to someone I see that's not as close to God as they should be, or not as close to God as I am, at least according to my view, then what does that cause me to do? It causes me to have a false sense of comfort of where I stand with God. It causes me to say, you know what? I'm better than them. I'm not dealing with that. So we feel good about ourselves when really we've got a lot to work on. Here's what happens. We're, we're listening to sermons. We're here in church or we're listening to a podcast. We're, we're going through a reading plan, a little devotional, and we're reading through it. And it rarely exposes anything in us. If you're looking for a sign, how do I know that this is maybe something I'm dealing with? If every devotion, every time you're stirred emotionally or spiritually, it's all about so-and-so needs to hear this. This would help so-and-so with their struggle. If it's always about deflecting that God may be speaking to you, but you're deflecting, God, all right, I know you're wanting me to deal with them about this. No, no, no. What if it's about you? If it's always about deflecting, God is speaking to so-and-so, God, that's not me, then maybe spiritual pride has crept in and... The symptom is you're finding the fault in others, but you're rarely, if ever, finding that something is going on in your life. Secondly, there's a harsh spirit. A harsh spirit. Like the Pharisee, we become so critical and speak of other sins and struggle with contempt and judgment rather than compassion. So what does that look like in, in real life? We hear of someone else struggling. Maybe we see it posted on Facebook, we kind of sense it through that, or someone reaches out to us, and we just kind of feel like, well, or we hear something, right? I mean, we hear stuff. We hear that someone's struggling, we hear, well they're, well, they're not in church because of this, or whatever the case may be, and instead of us going to them and confronting in love and trying to reach out, just like Jesus, he set that example, right? He, he left the 99 to go get how many? One. He was willing to do that. That reckless love, the song that we, we, we love to sing around here, is that he went out. He was, he was willing to be reckless. And why was he reckless? He was reckless because he was leaving 99, right, to care for themselves long enough to go get how many? Just one. He cares that much about us that it appears to be reckless, but it's actually what God calls us to do. And so that harsh spirit begins to develop in us, and all of a sudden we see someone struggles, and we see someone sins, and instead of going to them and saying, well, how can I help you? And it's their choice whether they want to be helped or not, but it's, it's, it's our responsibility to go out and say, will you come back? Will you let me help you? Will you let me minister to you? Will you let me do this? God forbid, sometimes here's what we do. We hear about it, and on Facebook, we just keep scrolling. We hear about it, and we say, did you hear? So-and-so is, I know I'm not speaking to anybody here. I'm just saying, you know, that sometimes instead of going out, we just kind of stay back and watch from a distance. And we say things like, well, 
If they would just raise their kids right, then they wouldn't be in this mess, right? We say things like, because we're in the South. If they would just spank their kids, they wouldn't act like that. And then on the other side, well, it's because they spank their kids, they act like that, right? Because you're never going to please everybody, amen? And so we're always approaching it with this, this harsh sense of, I'm holding you in contempt for your struggles. I'm condemning you because of your struggles, rather than being able to step in it with you and maybe help you out. Thirdly, the third symptom superficiality had to practice that one for a while superficiality i want to say it twice just to show off okay there's pride creeping in this pharisee was so focused on public virtue so that people would see how good he was out in public they would hear his prayer they would hear this these big huge words and phrases that he's throwing out there maybe he throws in some a couple of laws to remind them and i think that's essentially what was happening he wanted to point out all the sins and everyone else, all the laws that they were breaking so that it would hopefully deflect the fact that there was something going on in his own heart. And so instead of focusing on his private vices, he was trying to get people to focus on his public virtue. And what does this look like? We fight the sins that, that have an impact on how others view us. Now pay attention to this. And make peace not with God but the ones that no one sees. Let me explain. If we're struggling with something that's public, I don't know what that looks like for you. If we're struggling with something that's public, that everyone will see and take notice of, and they're going to point to that and say, well, that's unchristian. However you view that, whatever your standard uh, of moral behavior and ethics are out there, you say, well, I'm going to keep that clean. I'm not going to behave like that in public because everybody's going to see me. But that doesn't make me righteous just because I'm behaving according to a standard that I've set out in the world. I'm not doing those things. And in the way that I was raised, at least, okay, I I could say, you know, growing up, okay, so I I remember being drunk. I never smoked a cigarette. I was was abstinent. And all those things, so those big boxes that were public things, you know what, I could check those, right? And so that's what we're, but, but what spiritual pride looks like is, okay, you may be good with that. But what's going on on the inside? Are you being greedy in some way? Are, are you sharing the gospel as you should? When someone asks you to pray, are you actually praying for them? And as a teenager, for me, as I was checking all those boxes and going into college, and then they began, God began to confront, okay, are, are you honoring your parents like you should? And every teenager said, no way. <laughs> no. Show me a teenager that's honoring their parent perfectly, right? And I'll call you a liar, <laughs> So, so the reality is, it's, it, it's honoring, and that was not a call out on my daughter. She is perfect in every way. All right, so she assumes I'm always talking about her, okay? So, so we're just talking about vaguely. So begin to think about what does that look like for me? If I'm all about making myself look good in front of everybody, but I'm never looking inside and saying, God, man, the outside of my temple looks good, but on the inside, it's filthy. It's filthy. I'm being judgmental. I'm struggling with lust. I'm struggling with coveting someone else's stuff. I feel like I deserve that. They don't deserve that. What have they done to deserve that? How are they getting that? And I began to kind of work through all of that. So if my, if my f- approach to God and my worship to God is just on the surface, and it's just what everyone else sees, I may look like I'm holy on the outside, but only God knows what's happening on the inside. Number four, defensiveness. Defensiveness. Each of us will be challenged or rebuked by someone, sometimes by people we trust, and other times by those with, as we talked about earlier, a harsh spirit. In each instance, regardless of the challenger, how we respond or react reveals the condition of our hearts. And Jonathan Edwards says this. He says, 
For the humble Christian, the more the world is against him, the more silent and still he will be, unless it is in his prayer closet, and there he will not be still. Now, let me, let me explain what I'm not saying when I'm talking about defensiveness. What I'm not saying is, if someone confronts and, and, and tries to attack our morals and our beliefs and our standard, all of that, we're supposed to take a stand. There are certain beliefs in Scripture that we hold dearly that whatever the world is saying, this is acceptable out there, we have to defend our ground, right? We have to say, that's not happening here. We don't believe that here. We're taking that stance, amen? So what we're talking about is not, not being willing to defend. What we're talking about is an attitude of defensiveness. And so what that looks like is someone confronts me and my immediate response is, well, that's not me. Anybody been there? Somebody confronts me and I say, well, you heard that wrong. What have we just done? Instead of allowing ourselves and being silent, as Edward says, instead of allowing someone to confront us because they love us, whether they love us or not, whether they're just being critical because they have a critical spirit, that's a whole other issue. Either way, where someone is loving us and confronting us, or someone that's critical of us and they're confronting us, we as Christians are called to accept and listen and not be so quick to respond. You know how I got in trouble so often as a teenager? My mom or my dad or my stepdad wanted to tell me something that I needed to do that I wasn't doing. You know what my immediate response was? Absolutely. Anybody? Yes. When do you want me to get on that? It was, I don't have time. I don't want to do that. Or you throw in, if you have a sibling, you say, well, it's Stephen's turn. Right? It's Stephen's turn. I mowed last week. I took out the trash last week. Naturally, we are going to be defensive. And so it's something that we have to really, really present to God and allow us to help us with. So a symptom of spiritual pride is being defensive. Fifthly, presumption before God. So I'm going to get this line. A humble Christian approaches God with humble assurance in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to use those two words, the humble and assurance. So first, we should come to God with humility because we recognize who we are approaching and what he has done and continues to do for us. We shouldn't presume that God owes us anything. You need to get this today. Because God owes us nothing beyond what he's already done for us. He owes us nothing. You see, when, when, it's the reason why this cross is empty in our church. Why is that cross empty? It's because Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. All right? he, he died for us. And so that empty cross is not just a reminder that he died for us and it's past tense and our sins can be put under his blood. He sacrificed for us. He paid the debt of sin that we owe. And if we don't surrender our lives to him, then we have to pay that debt. And that, that debt is paid in eternal damnation to hell. Those are the facts. But if we have been saved and we accept his grace through personal faith in him, we recognize that the cross is empty, not just because he paid our debt there, but because Jesus lives again and he's the right side of God by the throne, and he's, he's waiting to come get his children. All right, so, th so those are the basics. That, that's 101. So we celebrate this empty cross because we know what God has done for us. So God owes us nothing. See, sometimes we get a little bit too comfortable with God when we come to him. It's just like, you know, growing up, if I just came to, you know, my stepdad Jimmy, who was, who was there in the house with us, and I say, Give me $20. What do you think the response is going to be, parents? Am I going to get that $20? Negative. If you are a parent and you give $20 to a child who comes at that, then, okay, stop giving them the $20 when they request it in that way or demand it, okay? So I'm not going to come like that. How am I going to come? I'm going I'm to come with humility. Jimmy, would you... You know, I've got this coming up, and i got this, and would you, 
mind lending me so that's, a, that's also a good one you know, lending me as if you were going to pay it back but lending me the $20 there, there's humility and we should come to God first to praise him first to acknowledge who he is why do we begin there why do we believe with hallowed be your name why do we start there with our our praise and our time with God we start there because if we come to God understanding who he is then all of a sudden we have humility and everything else we tell him but if we come to him and we don't come to him with hallowed be your name what we come to him with is we're we're friends here right we're we're bros, right? And so we just come in as if, okay, I'm just going to flop down on the couch. And there's a time for that. I believe there's a time for us. God wants the friendship. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to get on the couch and just hang out. But guys, He is still God. He is not one of us. He is God. And we need to come to Him with humility. We also need to come to Him with assurance. I believe that there's so many Christians, so many Christians. I just feel like so many struggle with this today. And we don't approach God sometimes because we don't feel worthy. You messed up and you say, God doesn't want to hear from me. People hear me today. The time he needs to hear from you is when you feel like you shouldn't come to him. That's when you need to be heard by him. Have confidence and assurance that every time you come to him, you have his undivided attention. Find assurance in that. Number six, I know what time it is. I know what time the Cowboys play. So don't shake your phones at me. We'll, we're going to be done, okay? They need all the prayer they can get, okay? Number six, along with my Falcons, okay? So, desperation for attention. As we give praise to God, we make sure we make ourselves out to be the hero in the story, too. And so what I would call this is we seek shared glory with God. The Pharisee was praying to who? himself right and his praising of God for what what was he praising God for how good he was and so th this desperation for attention that's what the Pharisee was doing and so again how does that look like for us here's what it looks like for us we'll tell a story of how God is so good but we make sure to point out how good we were too Instead of giving all the attention to God and give Him all the glory, we make sure to remind people, oh yeah, then you should see how I am at this. You see, and this could be something, I don't think we see this in ourselves, honestly. I, I think it takes us going to someone and saying, okay, when I'm telling a story, am I ever the person that doesn't come out ahead in the end? Am, am I ever the person that God is not on His throne going, that a boy, I mean, you, you are my greatest you are the best. You're the best parent. You're the best spouse. You're the best Christian down there. Everyone should be watching you. But to hear them tell the story from their perspective, it's, well, I'm just, it's all about God. It's all about me. So again, it's one of those things that only God can reveal to us, and maybe it's, it needs to be revealed to us through someone we love. Desperation for attention. To the prideful person, it sounds like shameless boasting about themselves or being unable to say no. This person is so busy because, like the Mary and Martha story, Martha was so consumed with getting things right and making sure that she knew that everything had to be done right, that Jesus was saying, no, 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 that's not how you worship me all the time. You need to sit before me and make it about me. You're, you're making this about you. And so I, I think we all wrestle with that sometimes. Whether we didn't get the attention we needed at home growing up, whether we're not getting the attention or the approval at work, you know, someone's getting, passing us up for that promotion, and we just feel like, man, nobody. So I've got to brag on myself, and, and it kind of creeps in just like that. And then lastly, number seven, 
neglecting others. Pride prefers us to seek out people we deem better than ourselves. We do. Another word for that would be favoritism. And here's how this looks. We consciously, consciously or unconsciously pass over the weak, the inconvenient, the unattractive, at least according to us, because they don't seem to offer us much. There's a thrill that goes through me when people with power acknowledge me. So again, if you're that person, and God help us that we're not that church, I pray that we're not, that, that, that our greeters and our people that you're sitting by, they're not going through you to speak to someone else they feel like they can gain from, right? And we all, we've all seen that in people. We've all felt like that in a circle before where someone was there, and, and because so-and-so was there in that circle with us, we got no attention because it was all about that person. And so as believers, we're not just supposed to widen our circle. We're supposed to give full attention and shared attention to everyone in the circle. That's what community, Christian community, biblical community is supposed to be like. Are we that person that we are constantly looking for at work? We're constantly looking for and trying to nestle up with and sit next to the person that's going to help us climb the ladder. Or we want to be sure our kids are hanging around with so-and-so because, well... That's who they should be hanging to get into that, that level of influence and popularity. What does it look like for us? Are we passing by and passing up people who need our attention far more than that person? Is that what Jesus would have done? Is that how he lived? No, he got in trouble for going to the weak, for going to the people who would... He would gain nothing from them. Let me wrap it up with this. Treating spiritual pride. How do we do that? What does it look like? I take you to the passage we used last week to battle against hypocrisy. In Psalm 139, 23 and 24 says this. I pray that it's a prayer for us routinely, daily, and from the heart. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Who's the only one who can know our hearts and our anxious thoughts? God's the only one. So allow him to come and speak. See if there's any offensive way in me. I don't know about you, but it, he's always going to come back with something. I mean, if, if I send God into my heart to do some intel of what needs improving, do you not think that every time he's going to come back, I found something, I have yet to send him into my heart, into the deepest crevices of my heart, and say, go find something, and him come back and say, we're good, Brian. We're good. Okay, so he's going to find something. Just, just turn him loose and lead me in the way everlasting. Can you bow your heads with me? God, I pray that you have used our songs today. You, you've used the people that are sitting around us. You've, you've used the environment. You've used this word and Call out something within us that may be prideful. It just may be a warning sign that, hey, you're, you're not prideful, but man, if you, you keep thinking like this, you keep doing this, you're, you're slipping in this area. As I said before, you, I pray that we have opened our hearts and our minds today up to God and so that He could truly search us and expose whatever it is that may grieve his heart. God, thank you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, then that's, that's really the first step in all of this. In order to have the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and transform our lives, he, he has to live within us. And so how we do that is we invite him in. And so if you need to invite Jesus into your life today, if you want to trust Him for salvation, I invite you to lift your hand. I'd love to pray with you today. Anyone here today, you need to take a step of faith, begin that relationship with Jesus.